mad. You got a right to be mad. Why you always gotta be so mad? Well, I have a lot to be mad about. And as a black American woman, growing up in a society where the system was built against you, where your people have been fighting the good fight ever since they were forcibly brought into this country, you have a lot to be mad about. And the more you learn, the more you'll have to be mad about. There's a saying by James Baldwin that to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in rage all the time. Now imagine how I feel as a black doctoral student researching environmental inequity, injustice, and data gaps in areas with majority black, brown, and indigenous populations. I am constantly enraged and constantly having to keep a tight grip on my emotions. The more I learn about how my community has been harmed time and time again, how our stories are getting written out of history through the lack of data, how science and society intentionally or not, continues to perpetuate harm onto my community. I have a lot to be mad about. But this talk is not about rage. This talk is about a seat at the table. A seat at the table is the name of an iconic album by Solange Knowles. It's a common phrase originally from the poem I too by Langston Hughes. I too sing America. I am the darker brother they send to the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be in the kitchen. I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Having a seat at the table is about power and access. It's about the ability to be seen, but more importantly, it's about the ability to be heard. During the Jim Crow era, African Americans were not seen as equal. We were forced to be second class citizens, hidden and out of sight. But tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. See, Hughes knew that having a seat at the table was about the power and the ability to steer the conversation. Early in my career, I remember hearing from many mentors about how you have to earn your seat at the table. You have to be patient to wait, listen, and learn so that when your time comes, you will be ready and able to handle the power and the responsibility that comes with having a seat at the table. Now, in my young mind, eager to be successful and eager to make a difference in the world, I held on to that idea for dear life. At the time, it made sense. You need a certain level of knowledge and experience in order to make change. Wrong. You really only need three things in order to make change. One, an idea. Two, a diverse team. And three, drive. During the summer of 2020, my life, like many others, was changed. It was a summer of turmoil and pain. It was like someone rewound the clock and took us back to 1960. We saw black Americans being murdered by police. We saw protests and riots in the streets. 
We screamed, Black Lives Matter. And we saw through video footage how racism infiltrated every aspect of our society, even in the outdoors. On May 25th, 2020, a black man, a lover of birds and comic books, a respected and well-known member of New York City Audubon, a birder, encountered racism in the outdoors when he, a black man, dared to inform a white woman that she was not allowed to have her dog off leash in a wildlife protected area of Central Park. As that interaction continued, we would see that woman call the police to say, a black man is threatening my life. Later that evening, we would watch as another black man had an encounter with the police that led to his murder. And over the next 72 hours, we would unintentionally rewatch that trauma as those two videos went viral. Now, I remember the summer of 2020. I had just defended my thesis. I was getting ready to start my dream internship with Audubon, North Carolina. Yes. That's right, I too am a bird nerd. I remember seeing the notification on my phone. A member of my social group, my online social support group, Black AF and STEM, had revealed how much pain and hurt they were experiencing over these two events. How it impacted their mental health. Not only did we see a black man murdered on video for the world to see, but another black man, a fellow birder, had been threatened with police violence. And we saw an alternative outcome of how that could have ended. Somehow, we had all experienced racism in the outdoors as graduate research assistants, as field technicians, as natural resource managers, environmental educators, we too had all had encounters with police or individuals who felt like we did not belong in their space. After a few tears and heartfelt stories, we wondered what more could be done? One member, Anna Gifty Apoku Egemen suggested we should have a Black Birders Day, a day to acknowledge the fact that Black Birders exist, that we have knowledge and experience, and sometimes even authority in the outdoors. Another member, Taiki James, suggested why stop at Black Birders Day? We should have a Black Birders Week. And thus, Black Birders Week was born. Now, I can't lie. I was a little bit nervous about what we were about to do. I had always been told that you have to wait for someone in a position of power to give you a seat at the table. But here we were building one. Over the next four days, 30 black STEM outdoor enthusiasts who had never met in person would work around the clock, united behind a common goal, to come up with a week's worth of engaging discussion topics, panels, guest speakers, flyers, artwork, networking mechanisms, and so much more to create the first ever Black Birders Week. Over the next four days, we created a social media campaign now, at the time, we had no idea that this campaign would be covered by CNN, Forbes Science, Scientific American, and so many more outlets. We had no idea that this campaign would be seen in over 54 countries around the world. We had no idea that our campaign would be able to connect people around the world during a time when none of us could actually connect in person. 
and unbeknown to us at that time, we had started a movement. That summer, we saw the production of over 30 Black and X weeks. People in other disciplines were inspired to call out racism, build community, and build opportunity for others who looked like them. Black Birders Week gave me the confidence and the knowledge to know that I don't have to wait for someone to offer me to seat at the table because I can build my own. All too often, Young people are told to be quiet and wait until someone can offer them a seat at the table of power. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of waiting for my seat at the table. I'm tired of feeling like my needs, my interests, my ideas don't matter. Like my ideas aren't potentially powerful life-changing, and even groundbreaking. Now, we could sit in our rage and let it consume us. But Solange reminds us that you got the light. Count it all joy. You got the right to be mad. But when you carry it along, you'll only find it getting in the way. Now, I'm here to remind you to take that rage, to take that pain, and transform it into how you plan to help the world. You are a light. Find your joy. You can do anything you put your mind to, as long as you have an idea, a diverse team, and drive. Now, for Black Birders Week, we took that drive, that pain, and transformed it into an event, a week-long worth of events, for us to share our experiences, reclaim our time, and reclaim our joy in the outdoors, despite what was going on in society. But I believe the true key to our success was the diversity of our team. Now, diversity includes, but also extends beyond ethnicity. We had over 30 young black STEM professionals with a variety of backgrounds and life experiences across disciplines, each with their own unique specialties and networks that we can call upon for help. And without that key, I don't think Black Birders Week would have been as successful as it was. All too often, young people are told to wait until someone can offer them a seat at the table of power. But a lot of the social justice advocates we know were young people when they started pushing for change and building their own tables. Martin Luther King Jr. was only 25 when he first started organizing. Fred Hampton, chairman of the Chicago chapter of an organization I'm not allowed to name, was only in high school when he started a student chapter of the NAACP. Leah Thomas, AKA Green Girl Leah, intersectional environmentalist, author, environmental justice advocate, is 28. Charlene Hunter Galt was only 19 when she desegregated the University of Georgia. Joseph McCain, Franklin McNeil, David Richmond, Jabril Kazan were only freshmen at North Carolina A&T when they decided to sit at an all-white lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina to start the lunch counter sit-in movements for the integration of dining spaces. You don't have to be a certain age to be a leader or an activist. It's not something that has to be given to you. You don't have to be invited in. No matter your age, no matter your background, you have power. And if the powers that be decide that you don't deserve a seat at the table, build your own. Thank you.